it's safe to say that oil has changed the world, for better or for worse. And with over 97 million barrels used per day worldwide, it's clear that it's still far from going anywhere. And while we have had technological and economic benefits stemming from oil, starting from its very discovery, oil filled those who wished to control it with greed and a willingness to do anything if it meant controlling more of the substance that would go on to power the world. This is the little discussed origin of the oil industry, and this is learn something new. The modern history of the oil industry started in 1847 with a discovery made by Scottish chemist James Young when he observed natural petroleum seepage from a coal mine. Taking the petroleum, he distilled both a light, thin oil suitable for lamps and a thicker oil suitable for the lubrication of machines. After seeing how well this worked, Young experimented further with coal and was able to distill a number of liquids, including an early form of refined petroleum. He patented these oils in paraffin wax, also distilled from coal, in 1850, and later that year formed a partnership with geologist Edward William Binney, together creating the first commercial oil refinery and oil works in the world, manufacturing oil and paraffin wax from locally mined coal. But Young wasn't the only scientist discovering new uses for oil. In 1846, Canadian geologist Abraham Geisner refined a liquid from coal, oil share, and bitumen that was cheaper and burned more cleanly than other oils, calling it kerosene, and founded the Kerosene Gaslight Company in 1850, using the oil to light the streets of Halifax and later the US. From these initial discoveries, many new businesses were formed, with the coal industry now also seeking to create the oils developed by Young and Geisner. But there would soon be a discovery in the United States that would bring interest in oil to the Americas. Edwin Drake was obsessive in his hunt for oil, working as the head of the drilling operations for the Seneca Oil Company, which sought to find oil as a means of making kerosene. He was called Crazy Drake after pouring the modern equivalent of more than $40,000 of investors' money, as well as his own labor, into a search that spanned more than a year without results. But on August 27th in 1859, his efforts paid off. He struck oil after drilling 69 feet into the ground in Titusville, Pennsylvania, making Titusville ground zero for the Pennsylvania oil rush. But although he was the first to engineer a successful oil drilling system, lining his well with piping to keep it from caving in, he never patented the method. And the money he'd made when he struck oil soon dried up as competitors rushed into the area, bringing Titusville's population from 243 people just before Drake made his discovery to 8,600 within the decade. One of those who heard about the discovery was John D. Rockefeller. In 1867, he and his brother William, as well as several others, created what was to become the Standard Oil Company. Additional discoveries near Drake's well had led to the creation of numerous firms, and the Rockefeller Company quickly began to buy out or combine with its competitors. As Rockefeller himself phrased it, their purpose was to unite skill and capital. By 1870, Standard had become the dominant oil refining firm in Pennsylvania creating pipelines to drive business and profits. Samuel Van Sickle had built a four-mile pipeline from Pit Hole, Pennsylvania to the nearest railroad. When Rockefeller observed this, he began to acquire pipelines for Standard. Soon, the company owned a majority of the lines, which provided cheap, efficient transportation for oil using Cleveland's transportation network for the majority of its early oil. By the 1880s, the company was already ranked as one of the world's biggest, and it was far from complacent, employing an industrial chemist, Herman Frosch II, to remove sulfur from the oil found at Lima, Ohio. Sulfur made distilling kerosene very difficult, and even then, it possessed a bad odor, another problem that Frasch solved. Soon, kerosene replaced other aluminants. It was more reliable, efficient, and economical than other fuels. Eastern cities linked to the oil fields by rail and by boat boomed also. As early as 1866, the value of petroleum products exported to Europe provided a trade balance sufficient to pay the interest on US bonds held abroad. 
When the Civil War interrupted the regular flow of kerosene and other petroleum products to western states, pressure increased to find a better method of utilizing oil found in such states such as California. But Standard exhibited little interest in the oil industry on the west coast before 1900. In that year, it purchased the Pacific Coast Oil Company, and in 1906 incorporated all of its western operations into Pacific Oil, now called Chevron. But there would be a new discovery that threatened Rockefeller's grip on the oil industry. Spindletop Hill in Jefferson County, Texas, had been known for a long time to produce a sticky black substance, which the Native Americans that had lived there had known about for centuries, often using it for medicinal purposes. At the end of the 1800s, Texas oil production reached around 800,000 barrels a year, which paled to the national total of 63 million. The black gold was making many people extremely wealthy, however, and any word of potential petroleum was worth looking into. Spindletop Hill was formed by an underground salt dome, which pushed the earth above it higher and higher as it grew. It was the mechanic and self-taught geologist Patillo Higgins who first suspected there might be oil lurking beneath Spindletop. Higgins organized the Glades City Oil, Gas, and Manufacturing Company in 1892 to look into the possibility, though his theory was met with widespread skepticism from petroleum and geological experts. Higgins ignored the skepticism, running a newspaper advertisement for fellow investors, and got a response from the Austrian-born engineer Anthony F. Lucas, who shared Higgins' view on salt domes. Lucas was able to convince leading Pennsylvania oilmen John Galley and James Guffey to finance a drilling operation. Notably, Lucas completely excluded Higgins from the arrangement. Drilling began at Spindletop in October of 1900, and by early January 1901, they had reached a depth of some 1,020 feet after overcoming initial difficulties in drilling into the sandy surface. And on January 10th, mud began bubbling out of the hole. Workers soon fled as mud came gushing out at a high speed, followed by natural gas and then by oil. The Lucas Geyser, as it was called, reached a height of more than 150 feet and was the most powerful that had ever been seen in the world. It was soon producing close to 100,000 barrels a day, more than all the other oil wells in America combined. Tens of thousands of people flocked to the Spindletop oil field, transforming southeastern Texas from a small town to a bustling city within months. Spindletop in 1901 saw the earliest beginnings of the petroleum company that would become Gulf Oil Corporation, bought out by Chevron in 1984. The oil struck at Spindletop also spawned the oil giants Texaco, which was founded as the Texas Fuel Company, Amoco, and the Humble Oil Company, later named Exxon. In its first year, Spindletop produced more than 3.5 million barrels of oil. In its second, production rose to 17.4 million. In addition to driving the price of oil down and destroying the previous monopoly held by John D. Rockefeller with Standard Oil, Spindletop ushered in a new era in Texas-based industry and was enormously influential in the state's industrial development. Within a year of its discovery, more than 1,500 oil companies had been chartered, and oil production in the United States by 1909 was more than that of the rest of the world combined. But as Standard Oil grew in wealth and power, it encountered great hostility not only from its competitors, but from a vast segment of the public, as it tried to secure special shipping rates and influence Congress through unethical means like bribery. Nor was the company's handling of labor any better. In 1911, the Supreme Court declared that the Standard Trust had operated to monopolize and restrain trade, and it ordered the trust to be dissolved into 34 companies leaving many with fears about the future of the cutthroat industry, with so many people fighting for market share. But the 1911 decision ensured that though the industry may have giants, they at least competed with one another, and they wouldn't have to worry too much about competing for customers, because the uses for oil were about to explode. While the primary uses for refined oil up until this point had been to lubricate the many machines of the Industrial Revolution and to serve as lighting, moving into the 1900s meant the mass adoption of electricity generated from coal and oil, as well as gasoline for cars and planes as they experienced widespread adoption. 
Machines of war for both World War I and II meant more and more uses than ever could have been conceived when it was first discovered. Oil propelled whole economies, opened up new technologies, and created more wealth than any industry that came before it. But greed, corruption, and conflict followed it everywhere. The cutthroat nature of the industry, as well as its environmental impact, leaves the benefits it provided to society with a tinge of sticky black. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like below, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.